Hello, um, welcome everyone. I'm Andrea Silvestri with GSA Center for Emerging Building Technologies in the Green Proving Ground, and welcome to today's webinar on an assessment of an automated building envelope sealing technology. Before we get started, I'm going to review just a few webinar logistics. So the webinar today will be in listen only mode and you can submit questions by using the Q&A button there on the bottom of your screen. And you don't need to wait until the end of the presentations to submit questions. In fact, we encourage you to submit questions well in advance of the Q&A session. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be shared with you. Um, you can find presentation slides and webinar recordings on our webinar page at gsa.gov. And you can also access all webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. Today's webinar is based on an evaluation by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and you can find the full report as well as summary documents on gsa.gov. And we'll also be posting links in the Zoom chat window. And before we get started, a quick rundown of the agenda. Um, to introduce the technology and why GSA is interested in it, we have Aaron Lannan, the yeah. program manager for the Applied Innovation Learning Laboratory. To walk through the evaluation from Oak Ridge National um, Laboratory, we have Emma Shah um, Ifa, uh, primary, the principal investigator on the, on the evaluation. And to give in, on the ground feedback, Tyler Cooper uh, will be joining us. He's a mechanical engineer and the GPG technical committee member from Region 8. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Aaron. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, so in terms of the opportunity of the automated air sealing product, air leakage is a significant driver in, of energy use within buildings and the US Department of Energy estimates that it accounts for approximately 4% of building energy use in the United States. Air leakage can also negatively impact thermal comfort, indoor air quality and mechanical ventilation system operation. Next slide. And in terms of how this supports GSA's climate goals, we have a lot of moonshot initiatives through Executive Order 14057. And we're really trying to align technologies for our program that are going to support our goal of having 65% reduction of operational carbon by 2030 and have our net zero carbon operations across our entire building portfolio by 2045. So, how does this specifically support building electrification? Automated air sealing can help um, effectively make your efficient electrification um, by requiring a tighter building envelope. And this is can be really applicable in buildings where um, perhaps you have a historic building and um, can be effective for brick, concrete, and limestone. Um, and then last but not least, what we found was um, specifying this in the design phase can really help in terms of reducing the HVAC equipment size and runtime. And so um, in terms of all of those added benefits, which Tyler and Emma Shaw will be covering later, that's how we see this as really helping support and catalyze our clean energy goals. And now I'll pass it over to Emma Shaw, who's going to walk through our measurement and verification of this pilot. Uh, thank you, Eri. And thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, the topic of my talk today is on the field demonstration and the MNB task to demonstrate an automated air sealing capacity in commercial building setting. Uh, this task is done here at Green National Lab by me and my colleagues Niraj Kunwar and uh, Mikhail Salomvara. Uh, the task of uh, the MNV uh, and the field demonstration includes uh, a field demonstration for enhanced air tightness and the corresponding energy savings. And additionally, we have also analyzed the carbon emission reduction potential, HVAC uh, equipment capacity reduction and the cost analysis for a payback period and return of investment. Next slide, please. Let us start uh, with on how uh, an automated air sealing system works. Uh, during this automated air sealing, a uh, building is pressurized using a modified blower door test, blower door test and a non-toxic aerosol uh, is injected from sealant stations. Uh, and the pressurization guides the aerosol sealant into the leaks so that the sealing process uh, takes place. Uh, considering uh, that this system has an automated sealing process, 
and the real time air leakage data monitoring it has the capability of removing uh, human error and can also reach inaccessible areas in the building envelope. Uh, the next slide has an animation on how uh, this automated air sealing system works. Uh, can you uh, please click on the animation? Yes. So uh, the first step in automated air sealing is a prep and a setup work uh, covering intentional openings such as vents and electric outlets, control panels, or TC. Placing the sealant stations that will inject uh, the sealants will be placed and uh, installing the blower door test and uh, and the second step is pressurize and start sealing. Uh, uh, wall compartmentalization can be done to specifically seg segment out which uh, specific areas that we are that's planned to 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 <coughs> seal and. Uh, the third step is uh, monitoring and finishing the ceiling uh, when it reaches the target air tightness. The last step will be a cleanup process. Next slide, please. Uh, the automated air sealing system by AeroSeal has the following system features. Uh, based on a green guard uh, gold certification in the manufacturer's data sheet, uh, the sealant is uh, ultra low uh, volatile organic compounds with no off gassing, which will allow it uh, to the space to be uh, reoccupied uh, after 30 minutes of the sealing process is done. Uh, in addition, the seal, the it can have the capability of sealing holes from 1,000 of an inch into a half an inch diameter. As I mentioned it earlier, it also has a real-time ability to track the building air tightness while sealing. Next slide, please. Uh, Aaron has covered uh, this uh, session earlier. Uh, apart from the obvious uh, energy benefits of a tighter envelope, uh, Tighter, envelope, uh, tighter envelopes can have a multiple uh, other advantages. Some of these are improved thermal comfort uh, by minimizing uh, things like drafts and cold spots, uh, better indoor air quality uh, by simplifying the controlled ventilation system and, and by limiting outdoor pollutants, dust, and unwanted odor from adjoining units. Uh, it significantly affects the moisture control strategy and the long-term durability. Uh, a tight envelope controls uh, moisture transport, which can be a main cause for mold growth, structural damage, and, and, uh, and mainly moisture-related uh, building envelope problems. Uh, noise reduction is another advantage of a tighter building. It can also be helpful for a compliance with building codes and standards. Next slide, please. Uh, finding a test bed uh, for the demonstration of uh, automated air sealing project was one of the challenging tasks of this project. After comparing uh, several buildings, finally we have selected uh, Building 40 at Denver Federal Center. Uh, this two-story uh, steel-framed brick facade building was built in 1940, and the gross floor area is more than 46,000 square feet. Next slide, please. Uh, the installation took place in the second floor of the west wing of this building 40, which is about 4,461 4, 4, square feet. Uh, this building was uh, going through a major retrofit at this stage uh, in preparation for a ceiling. Uh, two temporary walls uh, were installed to compartmentalize the ceiling area. And uh, intentional openings such as electrical outlets, fan vents were covered. And uh, we have acquired a third party contractor uh, to conduct a blower door test before and after the ceiling process. Next slide, please. This one shows uh, the initial condition of the building before the 
demonstration. Uh, the building was initially uh, a four inch uh, brick cladding with eight inch uh, CMU wall. And during renovation, the building was retrofitted with uh, three and uh, five eighths of uh, closed cell spray foam. And the windows are replaced by quad windows. From this, we can easily assume that the building might, the building can be an already airtight. Next slide, please. Uh, this table shows the major outcome of our MNV performance results. Uh, the building air tightness uh, through our demonstration has increased by 53%. Uh, it was initially 0 0.23 uh, CFM per feet square at 75 Pascal, and it, it, it was managed to be uh, lowered into 0 0.11 CFM feet uh, per uh, Per feet, CFM per feet square. And uh, energy modeling uh, shows savings up to 6 to 63% on uh, energy savings. And regarding the HVAC capacity reduction, a maximum of 67% uh, reduction for cooling and 71% reduction for heating is achieved for buildings with a uh, leaky base lighting and located in cold climates, and mainly with. Uh, large exposed surface area. And the saving to investment ratio is also achieved more than one for these specific buildings. Uh, next slide, please. This slide uh, is uh, showing on this, uh, using this table, how the baseline and the automated air sealed buildings air tightness can be compared to the existing code and standards. The International Energy Conservation Code of 2021 uh, states a requirement of 0 0.4 uh, CFM per feet square, while ASHRAE standard uh, 189.1 comments a maximum of 0 0.25 CFM per feet square. While GSA has uh, four uh, standard requirements for a baseline and high performance tiers, the document uh, facility standards for the public building service uh, classify it as tier one, tier two, and tier three. Based on our uh, demonstration results, uh, the baseline or the initial the building was initially 0 0.23 CFM feet per square which achieved a criteria of tier one. While the automated air sealing building was uh, 0 0.11 CFM per feet square, which is equivalent of close to tier three uh, performance. Next slide, please. Uh, the energy saving simulation model uh, that we used uses energy plus and ORNL's air infiltration calculator. The ORNL infiltration calculator uses uh, quantum for whole building air infiltration calculation and the energy plus simulation for whole building energy calculation. The main simulation parameters that we have selected uh, this study are the initial air tightness of the building, uh, building types, and different climate zones. The baseline air tightness values are classified as a leaky, medium, and airtight, and the assigned value are 1.2, 0 0.4, and 0 0.25 CFM per feet square. And four building uh, prototype models are selected, which are small office, a medium office, large two-story building, and large 12-story uh, building. And this is tested uh, across the uh, ASHRAE climate zones of 1A to 8A. Next slide, please. Uh, the, this one shows uh, an example from our simulation on energy saving simulation results. Uh, the, the overall uh, <coughs> Uh, conclusion is energy saving simulation results shows uh, a leaky buildings in cold climate zones with a larger exposed surface area uh, have shown a greater savings by applying automated air sealing. In addition, humid, cli humid climate zones uh, show a larger uh, savings than dry climates, uh, mainly because 
HVAC systems use additional energy for dehumidification. Uh, this graph shows the overall HVAC energy use intensity reductions for five cities, two buildings, and uh, three uh, initial uh, air tightness levels. The highest saving of 11.33 kilowatt hour per feet square was observed for the large two-story building with a leaky air tightness in Minneapolis. The lowest uh, EUI savings were recorded for an initially airtight buildings uh, in Phoenix and Albuquerque. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of how uh, an automated air ceiling uh, can support electrification by reducing heat pump capacity requirement. The baseline capacity requirements are shown in the second column. Uh, for a large two-story buildings in cold climate. And the third column shows the capacity savings uh, due to automated air sealing. This has given us a 71% and 41% capacity reduction for leaky and medium airtight buildings, respectively. This has saved more than 500,000 in initial leaky building and about 150,000 in medium airtight medium air tight building. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to the above mentioned energy savings and the capacity reduction, automated air sealing can have the capacity of additional savings by replacing some materials. Uh, this can be uh, interior cocks or foams or both, uh, excluding the fire cocking. Gaskets, which are which can be used in electrical boxes, plumbing penetrations, and data boxes, uh, caustic sealants, uh, packer road foam, and in certain application, uh, more expensive insulation such as closed cell spray foam can be replaced with automated air sealing and relatively cheaper insulations like fiberglass or cellulose or rock wool insulation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this one shows uh, uh, a leaky buildings in cold climates have a return of investment based on, on, on their energy savings alone. As can be seen uh, here, uh, Minneapolis and Chicago have a payback period of two years and five years if the buildings are uh, leaky already. Next slide. And if we include a cost saved by capacity reduction, leaky buildings in cold climates can have an immediate payback as shown here in case of a large uh, two-story building model located in climate zone 6A. Next slide. Uh, this will be uh, my final slide, I, uh, I guess. Uh, I will conclude my uh, presentation uh, by providing some uh, deployment recommendations on automated air sealing application. As an efficient electrification requires a tight building envelope, automated air sealing uh, can be the way uh, to achieve that. And uh, considering implementing automated air uh, sealing technology at the design phase, can be uh, helpful to reduce uh, both the HVAC equipment and uh, insulation uh, costs. Uh, and this system is also applicable to historic buildings and uh, maybe uh, particularly effective for bricks, concrete, uh, limestone facades where other insulation methods are not applicable. Thank you. Great, and uh, Tyler, um, if you want to give us some on the ground feedback of the uh, air ceiling at the Denver Federal Center. Right, thank you, Emisha. Um, we'll go next slide, yep. Okay, so um, yes, I want to just kick us off starting high level um, 
example of what we're where we're going um, overall path for um, the Denver Federal Center and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so right now we're targeting um, electrification of the entire campus. And this is one of the technologies that we've identified as a tool in our uh, bag to help meet those electrification goals and reduce energy consumption on the campus. One of the first principles of the electrification is um, working towards an efficient building envelope um, and then reduce the cost of uh, your total electrification by allowing the building to operate with um, lower capacity equipment. So when we can uh, optimize those building envelopes with these air sealing technologies, other windows, this becomes a total um, total package for that system. So right now we currently have a, a national deep energy retrofit project taking place at the Denver Federal Center. Uh, primary focus is the combination of geothermal and heat pump technologies being installed. Uh, as part of that, we are looking at uh, building envelope improvements too, um, which within that, uh, the goal is with the amount of geothermal wells we need to install, looking at this from a practical example, if we are able to apply this technology in the buildings, we'd be able to directly reduce the number of geothermal wells uh, required on the campus um, it also allows for lower uh, supply water temperatures during that process. Uh, next slide. So this is just an example of uh, some example picks from the installation that took place at Building 41. The entire sealing process was completed in two and a half hours. So that sealing process is dependent on what your starting air leakage rate is and then what that final target rate that you're going to for air tightness. So in our case, it took us two and a half hours. And then um, there was about seven hours of total preparation and cleanup work included with that. So you see here with these pictures, um, part of that initial preparation work is covering any horizontal surfaces or areas that we don't want that air sealant to get into. So you see here, we've got the air fusers and ductwork uh, covered. Anything that that sealant should not be entering into, uh, we're gonna be covering. Um, as well as uh, horizontal surfaces that also includes uh, window seals, everything else. Uh, next slide. So um, in terms of the building 40 retrofit we did was uh, during the middle of construction. Uh, this is kind of an example of what the preparation would look like for an occupied space. Uh, typically that, that is the uh, lift for that is gonna be much higher uh, initial lift. So you need to, uh, provide plastic and cover any horizontal services in the building. So that's going to be any solid, any finished floors. So any finished floors in the space, um, any personal belongings, so your desks, cabinetry, appliances, anything else in the space would need to be either be removed or covered in plastic as part of that process. So this results in about uh, installation costs roughly double that of an unoccupied new construction renovation type retrofit. Uh, projected costs from 2022 would put that for an occupied space at 175 a square foot versus 90 cents to a dollar square foot for new construction. Um, so typically the um, occupied spaces is going to be something we wouldn't recommend as much unless you had identified that there were major air leakage problems in the building. And uh, we'll go into that a little bit later. Uh, next slide. So uh, best practices and lessons learned. Um, one of the things is obviously we wanna specify this during the design phase. Um, if we can combine this with other, with the mechanical design process, uh, we have additional savings in HVAC capacity. Um, energy modeling is critical in optimizing those savings that we're looking for. One of the things noted is typically we wouldn't prescribe um, air sealing as a specific method, but as noted earlier, we would say we would set that as a tier three performance requirement for the air tightness that we're looking in the building. And then this would be one means to achieve that, which based on these studies would typically be a cost saving to the contractor by employing this versus conventional methods. Um, as Emma Shaw noted with the, um, as, as you noted with the climate areas and everything else, the savings are very site specific. Um, what, one of the best practices we'd identified was um, Unless you know what your air air, uh, air tightness is in the building already, doing a pre-installation blower door test is probably going to be in your best interest, just so you know how the building's performing. Um, but it's also going to be dependent on climate and exposed surface area in the building. 
And then uh, last piece was um, having the general contractor managing the installation process. This was just kind of, that was more of a sequencing that happened with this specific project since we were able to insert this during the middle of project construction. But because of that, we had to find a good time to sequence that in um, and insert that. But which in the case of building 40 here, we inserted, uh, inserted that in the process after uh, drywall and drywall was put up at the building. Uh, next slide. So um, within that, there are multiple entry points as far as when you would go through and uh, perform this automated air sealing at buildings. Um, typically, what we found the easiest way is to be um, post after any other insulation methods are performed. And once your electrical, mechanical, data, and plumbing are all installed, um, it's this method is going to be less, less expensive compared to spray foam installation and then reduces their cost of um, other interior caulking um, and sealing of different penetrations. So by coming in after those all those penetrations are completed, uh, we're uh, sealing up all those potential gaps and deficiencies that are created during the construction process. Um, within that, this provides the biggest impacts that reach the uh, furthest exterior spaces in the building. Um, and then within along those lines too, if uh, we're using fiberglass insulation, we you can either do that before or after that insulation is installed. So this will go through and it will find all those air gaps as needed. Uh, next slide. So within that, uh, the for post insulation pre drywall, uh, if there are any issues with that spray foam installation. Uh, this is another opportunity that you can come through and uh, perform that process. In the case of building 40, we did, the contractor had previously applied the uh, spray foam installation. We had a relatively airtight building, uh, as Emma Shaw showed, but we were still able to double the uh, overall airtightness of the building um, as a result of the aero barrier ceiling. Uh, next slide. So um, another point was in terms of if you were to install this post drywall after mud and tape's been put up, um, any, any deficiencies that were created in the building's uh, um, air or vapor barrier, um, this, the air, um, aerosol product will go through and correct, correct those deficiencies. And then it is the most common entry point in the project schedule, simply because once that drywall is put up, there's a lot more flexibility in the uh, construction timeline it allows to uh, ease of that process. Uh, next slide. Um, so within that, for in terms of deployment, um, really we've, we've identified that um, sealing the building envelope, improving the insulation is going to be critical to reaching our uh, net zero goals and reducing our heating and cooling loads. Um, if we're able to combine that with uh, technology stacking and reduce the size of our HVAC equipment, uh, that will see us um, get the biggest bang for our buck in terms of overall savings. Um, stresses the uh, importance of leveraging these technologies together. And with that, I will pass it on to question and answer. Great. Um, thank you, Tyler and Emma Shaw. So we have a number of questions. And I just say if we don't get to all of them, we'll follow up um, afterwards. And if we can't answer them, the same thing, we'll, we'll follow up with you. Um, uh, afterwards in an email. So um, the first question we have is, uh, what are the largest volumes that can practically be sealed this way? Emma Shah. Uh, I don't have an exact number, but uh, considering that uh, this aero seal, uh, air sealing system uh, takes place through uh, placing a number of uh, number of ceiling stations. Uh, so uh, what it will require is increasing the number of ceiling stations and the gap between them so that uh, it may uh, increase uh, its uh, volume area that it can seal. Uh, so mm, what I would say is uh, it could be it could be a, a, as big uh, as as needed if by adding those uh, multiple ceiling stations. Great. Um, in a complex layered system, is there concern that the ceiling will occur at the wrong layer, for example, in the intentional drainage gap, rather than at a more advantageous location? And 
either of you can jump in. Uh, this is a, a, a good question, and I, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, cares need to be uh, uh, taken uh, when uh, if uh, these kinds of uh, complex systems or, or uh, drainage, uh, the sealant might reach into this drainage. So uh, what I would suggest is to go with uh, a method that is followed in, in on intentional basis, so that to, to to cover areas where we do think that it would reach into that by using uh, uh using uh, uh polyethylene covers that we have used in uh for intentional rents um and if the aerosol product can seal up to half inch diameter holes how does it avoid sealing weep holes in the building on closure for drainage i think this is probably your same the same question really that you need to cover all the uh, openings that you don't want sealed um has the uh, product, uh, aerosol product in particular, been tested for compatibility with various building materials in which will come into contact? Mm -hmm. And will it prohibit adhesion of materials installed after the aerosol has been installed? Emma Shah, if you want to take that. Okay. Uh, what we have had is uh, uh, on on the manufacturer's uh, data sheet. Uh, the it shows that it should be uh, compatible into uh, typical uh, uh, drywall uh, uh, systems and uh, uh, any typical uh, building envelope materials, uh, mainly from the interior side. Um. I think, Tyler, this is a question for you on um, your experience with the post cleanup. So does the residue, did the process leave residue on space services that must be cleaned up afterward? How difficult or time consuming was that? Yeah, and so I think as we found out during the process, and I think this is standard, is any services that you're concerned about there being residue on, you should cover those spaces with plastic uh, before the installation process. In the case of our, our installation, we did not have the floor down yet, so there was a slight residue on the uh, floor, but that didn't require any additional cleanup uh, beyond what would be considered um, normal mm -hmm. dust, essentially, for construction. Mm -hmm. So um, we would want to do this process during renovation or new construction prior to flooring being installed. Um, are you recommending the air sealing with this method, method for duct work as well as for building envelopes? And Joshua, would you want to take that? Yeah, so the GPG program is testing out a sister product, AeroSeal, that's going to be the induct sealing, and we should have results from that study in approximately two years. And so we're validating our evaluation sites currently, and then we'll start installing that product and testing it in an induct scenario there. Thank you. And I should mention that Joshua is our uh, Green Proving Ground um, Program Manager. Um, thanks for being on the call with this, Joshua. Um, so can you seal one uh, room or zone at a time, or do you have to do the whole building? Uh, it should be, uh, both should be possible. Uh, from a cost savings perspective, maybe going uh, through the whole building might be uh, uh, needed, but uh, in cases like uh, when we uh, when we have selected a certain area, what can be done is uh, prepare uh, uh, makeshift wall systems and compartmentalize that one and uh, do the air sealing for that specific area. So uh, both, both are possible. Great, thank you. And I'm sure I think this is a question for you. Um, was there a simulation performed for a hot human climate, something like 2A, Austin, San Antonio, or Houston? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, we, uh, we did simulate for, uh, for instance, for uh, San Antonio. Uh, what we have uh, seen is uh, we do not have much saving when it comes to uh, heating, but there are uh, uh, there are savings when it comes to uh, 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 cooling load. So, uh, so uh, yes, uh, we have uh, we have managed to see. Uh, uh, some savings, but might not be as big as the uh, cold climate ones, which require a high uh, heating load. Great. And you can find more of those results in the full report. Um, and Amsha, why did you use CFM per square foot of floor space rather than the wall envelope square footage? Uh, 
Yes, in this case, uh, we do have uh, this uh, envelope uh, square footage information on the uh, uh, on the uh, report as well. But the reason that we have selected this uh, CFM per feet square is uh, to match it with the existing uh, code and, and standards, which are usually set into uh, uh, CFM per feet square. Thank you. I think uh, I just with the blower door testing, we did we did take that in CFM per cubic foot. So great. Thank you. Um, so what time of year were the cost savings calculated by city um, where you found that the colder climates had greater savings? Um, and if this study was done in the summer, for instance, with Phoenix having uh, 120 degrees, would you see similar savings? Uh, we have we have run this for an annual, including all for all four seasons, uh, and uh, once again uh, we like in mild climate uh, zones where the outdoor uh, temperature uh, is uh, relatively nearer to the uh, indoor one, we do not get uh, higher savings. Uh, similarly, in hotel regions, uh, we do not since we, we do not need much of uh, a heating load. We are only having a cooling load, uh, so that's why those uh, those savings are relatively lesser, because in uh, Colder climates, we do need uh, both the heating and cooling systems. So, as well. Thank you. For the field study at the Denver Federal Center, how much supplemental air sealing was necessary in order to address large gaps or holes that can't be sealed solely with automated air sealing? So I guess, what did you have to do? Any Was there any sealing after the automated air sealing process? No, I no as, as I mentioned in on, on the slides uh it was uh, uh the building was uh, initially uh an initially airtight building so uh there wasn't uh any additionally needed uh, manual uh, uh sealing work so it was uh, it was a purely automated air sealing um when we're talking about covering the horizontal surfaces does this include ceilings yes um, no, I think Tyler, I don't think you need to cover ceilings. Is that, is that correct? Tyler, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah. So the horizontal, that would just be any, we're essentially the, how the product's working is it's finding any pressure differences in the space. So, um, and then once that pressure difference is off, that said, um, aeroseal is going to settle. So in this case, it's not going to adhere to the ceiling surfaces. Great. Um, uh, and Amishad, do you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, uh, mainly when uh, when it comes to uh, uh, covering the ho covering the horizontal surfaces, it is basically uh, is to uh, collect or pick up uh, to collect or pick up uh, the uh, aerosol which hasn't uh, which hasn't managed to uh, cover uh, those holes, so that a cleanup process uh, can take place. Is Thank you. Um, do we know what the lifespan of the sealant is and how long it can withstand the shifting or moving and expansion contraction of materials? Uh, the manufacturer's uh, data sheet states uh, it has a 50 year uh, life, lifespan. Thank you. Um, so uh, what are the potential negative consequences of prep work was not properly completed? Um, you know, in other words, the sealant, sealant getting into duct work um, what are uh, potential negative uh, issues that could occur? Uh, can this question be repeated? Mm -hmm. What are the potential negative consequences of the prep work wasn't properly completed? Uh, well, uh, it could be several things. Uh, this uh, sealant uh, will get into uh, unannounced places and plug in uh, our electric vents, uh, HVAC ducts ca can be sealed. And uh, uh, if we haven't covered uh, an existing furniture properly, it might it might stick into it and then things like that. So the prep work uh, is, is, is required. Um, let's see, uh, I think these have been answered. Um, uh, there was a question about what the mist was in the last slide. So what is it that is aerosolized and distributed? Last slide. So it's essentially, it's a, it's an, it was an image of the aerosolized process. Um, mm -hmm. um, 
So what is it, what is, uh, I think you talked about it being non-toxic, but can you talk a little bit more about what the uh, compound is that is distributed? Uh, specifically, uh, uh, I, I cannot exactly tell uh, what the uh, uh, product compound is, uh, what is it uh, made of, but uh, once again, uh, the um, manufacturers, uh, data sheets and uh, uh, and other certification shows that it is uh, it is uh, uh, non VOC uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, a water based uh, uh, sealant. Um, how long did the sealing take, and did it take multiple sealing efforts? Does it take multiple sealing efforts to seal a large building? Uh, in our case. Uh, Excluding the prep and the cleanup work, it took about two hours and 10 minutes, uh, starting from the initial uh, air tightness to the uh, final, the targeted one, which was 0 0.11 CFM feet per square. So uh, that was done uh, in one sense that, uh, that uh, air tightness is achieved. And on the next day, uh, we have tested, uh, we have tested the uh, new uh, uh, air tightness uh, through a third party contractor uh, using blower door test, and that value was achieved, and that was done in, in, in one go. Um, were the leakage rates and tests done for both building pressurization and depressurization? Uh, no, uh, we only did uh, uh, through uh, pressurization. And Tyler, I noticed, did you have something to add, add to that? Aaron. No, no, I'm good. Okay, Sorry. great, thanks. Okay, um, has this system, do we know if the system and process has been peer reviewed by building enclosure experts? Uh, I am aware of uh, a previously uh, published technical reports uh, uh, technical reports uh, done by other researchers on automated air sealing product of uh, aero barrier uh, for residential buildings. So there are other there are other literature which is out there. Great. Um, we have a number of questions on whether the sealant would be considered um, for fire code gaps. Do we we may not be able to answer that, but I'm going to ask it. And if we can't answer it, we'll get back to you later. Mm -hmm. Amasha, do you happen to know the answer to that? Um, uh, not really. Uh, okay, great. We will get back to you on that. And Joshua, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, that's one of the questions that we'll get back to. And any additional questions that anyone has or thinks of after this, you can always email us at gpg at gsa.gov and we'll be able to answer questions there. And there's also on the last slide that was up, email contacts for members of our team and so right. if we can't answer it now we'll follow up afterwards right. we'll show that again those contacts um so one of the biggest sources of leaks is around windows with some poorly built windows air leaks result in condensation will aerosol eliminate that condensation and how do you prep windows to allow proper sealing mm -hmm. oh. from our uh field demonstration experience uh the, if there is uh, an opening between uh, the glazing system and, and, and uh, the opaque envelope, uh, it has uh, managed uh, to air seal it. And uh, by, by doing that, it will be uh, helping the air, the air infiltration of, of uh, either the cold or, or the, the cold weather uh, or the case of condensation. Uh, that can be uh, basically uh, avoided from entering. So uh, yes, uh, it, it, it can definitely uh, help uh, sealing those, uh, those unwanted gaps uh, either in uh, uh, glazing systems or or, or door openings. Thanks. Um, uh, are there any concerns with drop ceilings in a retrofit scenario, i.e. the tiles becoming adhered to um, in the support grid? Uh, we have to come up uh, with an answer for this. Let's answer this at a later stage. Okay. Um, is there only one choice of sealant type? Uh, 
this uh, should be a question for uh, uh, for the manufacturers, but uh, uh, I may be wrong. But what uh, what I understand is that there might be certain uh, choices. What uh, in terms of ceiling capacity, uh, they might be uh, more or less the same. But we can reach out to the manufacturer and uh, come up with an answer. Um, if you're renovating only one floor of a multi-floor building, would you rec recommend ceiling for just one floor? Uh, it would depend on, uh, uh, once again, on on what type of building and in what uh, state it is, uh, if there are still furnitures and things like that, uh, yes. Uh, but for instance, if it is being uh, retrofitted and uh, if it's being retrofitted or uh, if it is a new construction and if all drywalls are, are, are erected, maybe going through a one step, having one floor, uh, having having multiple uh, floor doors at, at uh, different uh, entries and doing it at once might be uh, might be the solution. So it should be a case by case, uh, a case by case. Yeah, and I think from my perspective, what I would look at is how easily you can isolate that floor from the rest of the buildings. So in the case of building 40, we only did about 10% of the building square footage. So we had to build temporary uh, enclosures mm -hmm. uh, in the hallways to section off that portion of the building and get it to pressurize. Mm -hmm. So in cases where if you have one floor can easily isolate those four from the others, other floors in the building, um, I think that would, that would really be what I would look at as that criteria um, as well as performance from an air leakage standpoint. But if we can isolate and pressurize that floor, pretty easily that will make that process easier. And Tyler, such a small area was done in this case because it was a evaluation. Is that is that? Yes. Um, I think yeah, Michelle, this is a question for you. At what pressure pressure uh, pressure rate were the leakage rates determined? Was it 75 PA? Uh, the ones that I have presented today is, is 75 uh, uh, Pascals, so, but uh, the blower door test is conducted at 10 point uh, uh, pressure scale. So we do have both results for 50 Pascals and 75 Pascals on the report. And I think this is a question about the HVAC ca capacity reductions calculations. How were those total system and calculations measured? Calculated? What we have done is uh, we have uh, calculated uh, the required uh, wattage uh, with uh, with the building uh, uh, air tightness initially, which was uh, a leaky one, and the second one is an airtight one. And then uh, we have uh, we have found out how much of uh, how much of uh, 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 heat capacity uh, reduction is, is obtained. And we have uh, multiplied that by uh, uh, by an uh, uh, EIA uh, da data, which shows how much of uh, how much of uh, a KBTU uh, per hour uh, uh, would cost uh, in in uh, on for that specific uh, 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 heat pump system. Uh, in our case, we have selected a rooftop. Uh, heat pumps, which was about $166 per uh, kbtu per, per hour, when we have uh, multiplied the change in the capacity reduction, uh, we have come up with those numbers. Um, and this question, I think, is a, a follow on to that is how did you separate the savings from the original? Um, I, I assume it's the original ceiling um, at, from the error seal um, automated building envelope ceiling. What what is uh... um, the question is um, how did you how are you ensuring that the savings are from this technology and not your original um, oh. simulation? Uh, yeah, in our uh, simulation models, uh, what we have done is uh, we have kept everything constant. So uh, we have this uh, DOE uh, prototype building models, and we have uh, keep uh, every other thing constant, and we have only varied the uh, building air tightness uh, or or the air infiltration rate. So that uh, that would basically calculate how much of uh, heating and cooling load is uh, demanded from the uh, HVAC. So that is uh, that is how we try to segment out specifically the. Specifically, the effect of air tightness uh, uh, towards those savings. Um, and this is a clarification on a previous question. 
And it's uh, partly because at the DFC, um, the Building 40 was already airtight. It had already gone through its initial insulation. Does this process assume or require that you already do uh, and that the insulation process and then follow it with Aero, Aero Zero? Uh, can you please elaborate this mm -hmm. question? So yes. So, and Tyler, you might want to jump in here as well. So the question is, so because the Building 40 was already airtight because it had already gone through uh, a process to insulate it, um, how is GSA evaluating using aero barrier for leaky buildings? Does it need to be a two-step process, first spray foam and then aero barrier, or can you go right to aero barrier? Uh, I can't, uh, yeah, uh, I'll try to answer this. Uh, that can be basically then uh, without uh, air, it being airtight. Uh, in this case, it was uh, it's an initially because airtight. It's because uh, there were other there were other uh, renovation plans, and uh, our demonstration comes at a later stage. But uh, had uh, had it been uh, needed in as my slide last slide shows uh, this is like uh, had implementing this automated air sealing at a design phase, it can come up with uh, at an earlier stage so that it could even save uh, uh, maybe additional uh, insulation costs and HVAC demand reduction. So it doesn't need to be uh, highly insulated first, followed by uh, uh, followed by this air sealing. And then I'll just say, I think from what I would, process I was leading to is we would set this as a prescriptive performance requirement, mm -hmm. saying the building um, building needs to achieve this level of air tightness and this um, a set insulation value uh, for the exterior envelope. And then that's when this is providing another solution to the uh, general contractor as far as how they're gonna meet that air tightness level. Mm -hmm. So in the case of this, spray foam is one option with, spray foam is probably been what we, um, one of the more conventional options for our buildings, mm -hmm. but um, this is another alternative that combining with other insulation types would put, put, presents a cost savings opportunity. Thank you. Um, can this method of automated building envelope ceiling can be applied just to attics? Uh, 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 yes, uh, the, yes, uh, yes, it does. Uh, there are, uh, I have seen certain applications where it was used uh, uh, in whole uh, uh, residential building uh, uh, system. So uh, the answer is yes. And are you worried that in cold climates, insulating on the insides of masonry buildings can accelerate freeze thaw, uh, thaw cycles for the masonry, uh, spe especially old brick? And again, we may not be able to answer this, but um, that's a question. And sounds like this is maybe a question we want to answer later. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, there are a number of questions. Again, this might be an answer later question, but since we have a few minutes, um, could this be useful for sound rated rooms? So not just for uh, for um, for sound protection. And there are a couple of questions that came in about that. Uh, I will try to answer this from uh, 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 an over uh, a higher level uh, uh, perspective, uh, which is. Uh, uh, as as we mentioned, uh, an air leakage uh, can create a noise reduction, and uh, uh, sealing those uh, sealing those cracks or holes uh, would definitely uh, help in noise reduction perspective. So, uh, I would say uh, there are uh, positive there are positive outcomes by uh, air sealing our holes or, or cracks uh, to an out uh, to an outdoor environment, which could help us in noise reduction. Um, great. Um, for an existing building, uh, wouldn't you need an air barrier test early on to confirm major holes or leaks um, for uh, floor to floor, for example, so those could be accounted for in the design? Uh, 
Well, uh, in our case, uh, our demonstration takes place in uh, in an already renovated area, but. Uh, uh, yes, uh, that should be the case. Uh, even from a cost savings perspective, uh, if there are larger holes uh, than a half an inch, uh, basically that needs to be taken care of through maybe an existing uh, an existing uh, ceiling systems uh, through uh, spray forming and then uh, things like that. So, uh, yeah, if uh, that using a, a, a pre check before going for. Uh, the sealing process can be helpful. And Tyler, is there anything you would like to add to that? No, I'd say from our end, I think the building pressurization testing has typically been a requirement for residential buildings and not for commercial. So the addition to the P100 has been, uh, that's been a recent addition to the P100 for pressurization testing. And uh, ideally, we should be doing that pre and post and pre designed so that we know that as we're entering that renovation process. Um, we may be able to answer this question. Uh, uh, we have some poured concrete buildings that are very leaky. Would this help us and not cause additional problems? Uh, my answer is uh, I know uh, concrete masonry units uh, being sealed uh, through a uh, 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 aero barrier uh, product. And uh, uh, it has actually uh, been recommended uh, to use uh, air sealing, especially if we are not uh, if we are not able to use uh, insulation systems in those in those states. So uh, I, I I can see uh, it can be uh, helpful, but uh, once again, uh, it, it like we need to know what kind of what kind of uh, these uh, uh, concrete buildings are, uh, what, uh, how leaky they are, and things like that. But uh, I will say there is there is a significant possibility that it can be helpful. Great, thank you. Um... So I think with that, we will follow up with additional questions um, and uh, we'll be sharing a copy of the recording um, as well as the slides. Um, you all will be receiving a survey. And by completing the survey, you can receive continuing education credit. If you're a member of the American Institute of Architects, um, you can get a, um, a, credit, a, a continuing education credit through them. And if you're a GSA um, employee, then you're also able for one continuous learning point. Um, and we will be um, uh, sharing links as well. I think some of you had um, challenges with the links not copying and pasting. And our follow-ups will be sending copies of the slides, the recordings, the full report, all of our summary documents, as well as I know, Emma Shaw, you mentioned some private research. We do have our web pages have additional research and you can access those here. So um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Tyler, Emma Shaw, Aaron, and Joshua for um, um, helping out with the Q&A and for presenting. And um, we look forward, again, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you, bye.